Okay, well, good morning. Welcome back to our study in 2 Chronicles. And this morning we're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 11. So if you're not there, go ahead and open up to 2 Chronicles 11. And before we look at this chapter in detail, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for another day you've given us to study your word. We just pray you'd help us to understand your truths that you have not only recorded but passed down from generation to generation for our blessing and for your glory. So we thank you for this time to get into your word. And we just pray we'd live it out for your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So again, we are in 2 Chronicles chapter 11 as we continue to march through this book, this historical narrative. And we are still in the section of Rehoboam. We started the Rehoboam section last week with chapter 10. Remember first, the first chapter through the ninth chapter focused on Solomon. And then starting in chapter 10, we focus on Rehoboam, who is the son of Solomon, who becomes the king of the southern kingdom. As we saw last week in chapter 10, the United Kingdom, that United Kingdom that was ruled over by Saul, then David, then Solomon, has now split into two kingdoms, a north and a south, Israel and Judah. But as we're going to see in this chapter and further chapters, there's still this idea of all of Israel. So even though we're dealing with two nations, we still got to think of Israel as one people. Again, we'll see that, I think, throughout this chapter and other chapters. But we are in that divided kingdom time period. Now, Second Chronicles is not going to focus too much on the northern kingdom. There will be some interaction, but for the most part, the Chronicler is focused on the southern kingdom. And he has his theme as he's working this book out, as he's writing this book under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And that theme is to show, I think, the future aspect of the southern kingdom, that these readers are post-exile, they've seen the destruction, they've seen the exile of their southern kingdom, but the Chronicler is giving them hope. He's recording the history, or he's... He's rehashing the history, but in light of this history, there is still that promise of national sovereignty under a Messiah. So chapters 10 through 12, Rehoboam. Now as far as how this chapter breaks down, I break it down into four different sections. The first four verses focus on Rehoboam's preparations for war. So he prepares for war, and we're going to see that. And then from verses 5 through 12, we see Rehoboam's defensive cities. So he's going to build strategic cities throughout Judah. And then verses 13 to 17, we see Rehoboam's support. He's going to be supported by the Levites and the priests. And then the last section caps off with a summary of Rehoboam's family, which is going to play an important role as we move into chapter 12. Now, if you wanted to check the parallel section, most of this is not paralleled in 1 Kings. Now, the first four verses, we can go to 1 Kings 12, verses 21 through 24, and that is a parallel section. Now, there is going to be some discussion on Jeroboam here in 2 Chronicles 11 and his idolatry. You can go back to second, uh, 1 Kings 12, and there's more discussion on him, but we don't really necessarily consider it a parallel section. So you can spend some time in 1 Kings 12, and then actually 1 Kings 13 and 14 continue speaking about Jeroboam. We're not going to see him much. He will be highlighted here, but again, that's not the Chronicler's purpose. So if you want to learn more about Jeroboam, who from last week, he's going to be the leader of the northern kingdom, check out 1 Kings 12 through 14. So with all that, let's jump into it verse by verse, starting in verse number 1, which says, Now when Rehoboam had come to Jerusalem, now recall from last week, at the end of the chapter, Jeroboam had, or Rehoboam had to flee for his life, and then he comes back to Jerusalem. So some point after that, we come into chapter 11, verse 1. Now Rehoboam, when Rehoboam had come to Jerusalem, it says, He assembled the house of Judah and Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam. So one of Rehoboam's first acts is to take revenge and to subjugate the northern kingdom. Again, there's been rebellion. The, the 
ten tribes of the north have basically told Rehoboam, we don't want anything to do with you. Take care of yourself. We are our own kingdom now under the leadership of Jeroboam. And as we saw in chapter 10, Rehoboam sends Hadariam. Most commentators thinks he, think that he sent him to negotiate some kind of peace treaty or uh, a reconciliation. I believe he sent him up there to force the northern tribes to come under his rule and reign. But obviously that didn't work as Hadariam is killed. And that's where Rehoboam had to flee for his life. So Rehoboam takes the next step. And that is fine. If you don't want to come under my sovereignty, then I'm going to make you. So he gathers 180,000 men, warriors from Judah and Benjamin. And we see two reasons. Number one, to fight against Israel. So he's preparing to fight against the northern kingdom under the re leadership of Jeroboam. But there's an ultimate purpose to that fighting. And that is, as we see in verse 1 at the very end, to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam. So he's, his plan is to reunite the division. So how does that go? Well, it never happens. And why is that? That's because the Lord's sovereignty. And we see that verse 2. But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, so now we're introduced to this prophet, and he's introduced with the term, the man of God, which is just another word or a, another way of referring to him as a prophet. He is a prophet of God. So the Lord communicates his word to this prophet, and that word we see in verse 3. He says, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel and Judah and Benjamin, saying, now, as Paul's right there. So this prophet is commanded to take this word to Rehoboam. But not only to Rehoboam, it also says to what? To all Israel in Judah and Benjamin. Now, it's interesting that he referred to all of Israel. He could have said, take the word to Judah and Benjamin but he happened to put that to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin. So there's still that idea, even though we have a divided kingdom, that we still have one people of God, Israel. Even though they're divided in two nations at this point, essentially Israel is still Israel. So what is this prophet, the, son, the man of God, supposed to communicate? Well, we see that in verse 4. So this is the actual command. Thus says the Lord, you shall not go up or fight against your relatives. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. So they listened to the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. So let's look at this verse in a little more detail here. And what we see is two negative commands and one positive command. So this word, thus says the Lord, you shall not go up, first of all. So again, Rehoboam's made all these battle preparations. But the Lord says, you shall not go up. And then he says, and in the Hebrew there's two negatives here, you shall not fight. You shall not fight. So we see the two negative prohibitions, and then he follows it with a positive pro prohibition, or a positive command, not a prohibition, but a command. He says, return. So we have two negative prohibitions and one positive. Return every man to this house, or to his house. In other words, the Lord does not want Rehoboam to fight against the northern kingdom. And notice a couple of other interesting things. He says you shall not go up or fight against your relatives. And the word for relative there is translated in other contexts as brother or brothers, if you look at the plural. So again, there's still that emphasis. This is still God's people, Israel, even though we have this split. But the other interesting thing we see is the four right here. Why shall they not go up and fight and instead return to their houses? For this thing is from me. In other words, there's a focus on God's sovereignty here. This is not the Lord's will for Rehoboam to fight against 
Jeroboam, and the northern kingdom. And we saw that in verse 15 of chapter 10, where we actually see the split. And the split is attributed to being part of God's will. It is a turn of events from the Lord. And likewise, this battle is not going to happen because it's not the Lord's will. And we see a positive response from Rehoboam and Jerob, uh, from Rehoboam and from the people of the southern kingdom. So it says, they listened to the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. So Rehoboam and the people of the southern kingdom are positive to God's word here. They are walking in obedience. And that ends that threat for now. So we see Rehoboam in the southern kingdom actually starting out on a positive note. Now as we continue, Rehoboam is still thinking in his mind, security. So now he's going, the, the, at least the chronicler is going to shift the attention away from this potential battle, north versus south, to the fortification of the southern kingdom. So we see in verse 5, Rehoboam lived in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. Thus he built Bethlehem. And now we get to see a list of these fortified cities. And it starts off in verse 6 with Bethlehem, Etam, and Tekoa. Now here's a map. This is from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. You can check page 629. Now, just as a reference here, Jerusalem, again, would be up in kind of this area right here. So when we see these cities, we're going to see that they're all to his south and somewhat to the southwest. So verse 5, and there's going to be 15 cities in total. So we see here in verse 6, I'm sorry, not verse 5, verse 6, we see Bethlehem, Etam, and Tekoa. So we see Bethlehem right here. We see Etam in Tekoa. Now as far as how these cities are listed, there's not a good idea as to why they're ordered and the way they're ordered. So we don't want to make too much of it. There's possibly a reason, but we're not certain. Verse 7, it continues the fortified cities with Bethzur, Soko, and Adulam. So we have Bethzur, Adulam, and Soko. Verse 8, Gath, Merashah, and Ziph. So we have Merashah, we have Ziph, and then we have Gath. Now, this Gath is probably not the same Gath that we're normally familiar with when we talk about the Philistine cities, usually down here on the coast. This is probably a different Gath. And then verse 9, Adoram, Lachish, and Az Azikah. So we have Lachish right here, Adoram, and then we have where's uh, Azikah right here. Verse 10, Zorah, Ajalon, and Hebron. So Zorah, Ajalon, and then Hebron down here to the south. And he adds a further note with verse 10, which are fortified cities in Judah and in Benjamin. So we have these 15 fortified cities. And notice, they're basically, as I said before, they're to the south and southwest. Again, Jerusalem will be right here. We saw the note in verse 5. That's where Rehoboam has settled himself. And that makes sense since Israel, uh, Jerusalem was an important city in the kingdom of David and Solomon. And Rehoboam makes that the capital city of the southern kingdom. So all these Cities are to fortify the south. Now, why, now again, we just got done talking about the north and him preparing to fight the north. So why the focus on the southern fortified cities? Who would be a threatening force to come up from the south? Egypt, yes. Save that in the back of your mind. Because next week in chapter 12, we're going to see Egypt play a role. So at this point, things are going very well. 
I think you can see the, the blessings of the Lord on Rehoboam and the southern kingdom. They're fortifying these cities. And in addition, we see a blessing of outside, I want to say outside support, some outside support. As we see, well, let's, we didn't finish this section. I got a little ahead of myself. I'm getting excited about the next section here. Let's finish this section. Verse 11, we have a few more details about these fortified cities. He also strengthened the fortresses and put officers in them and stores of food, oil, and wine. So not only is he fortifying them with probably defensive structures, walls, that type of stuff, but he's putting leadership in the cities and he's well stocking them. They have food, oil, and water. And what else could you ask for? As long as you have that, you have leadership, and you have some fortification, they're ready for battle. Except that maybe they need some instruments of war. And that's what we see in verse 12. He put shields and spears in every city and strengthened them greatly. And that's very, I think, very strongly worded in the Hebrew text. He strengthened them greatly, exceedingly. So these are very fortified cities. They're well prepared for attack and for warfare. So he held Judah and Benjamin, the last clause there to end this section. So we see Rehoboam really strengthens and establishes this defensive system to his south. He's well prepared from a human perspective of taking any kind of attack. But we know Israel's security and safety is not dependent on man's plans. Again, I think that's why this section is here. Rehoboam starts out well in his rule and his reign. But like his father, eventually it goes downhill. So we're in that kind of climax right now. He's being blessed. He doesn't go to war against the, the north. He fortifies his cities. He has them. They're very well fortified. They're very well stocked. And you can cap it off with saying, he held Judah and Benjamin. It's firmly in his grasp. So if you're an outsider looking on, you're like, this guy is doing pretty well. And I think there's a reason for that, which we'll get to in just a second. But he, as I mentioned a minute ago, for our, as I got ahead of myself, he also has other support. And other support from the outside, outside of Judah. So look at verse 13. Moreover, the priests and the Levites who were in all Israel stood with him from all their districts. Now remember the Levites were in priesthood, were, they were scattered throughout the land. They didn't have necessarily land of their own, but they were taken care of by the Lord. And these Levites and priests stood with Rehoboam. They took his side in this national split. And notice the last part of verse 13 says, from all their districts. So this is not the tribe, this is not the Benjamite, I mean, once again, I'm getting ahead of myself. These are not the Levites and priests from Judah and Benjamin exclusively. These are the priests and Levites through all the northern kingdom. They're standing with Rehoboam. So much so, look at verse 14. For the Levites left their pasture lands and their property and came to Judah and Jerusalem. So they're giving up. And again, we don't may maybe think about land as, as special as it is was back in Israel's day. Land was very important to them. They passed it down to their children and their grandchildren. It was a key aspect of Israelite life. And they're giving it all up to come to stand with Rehoboam. As one commentator said, it quite possibly the chronicler is throwing this in to encourage the Levites and priests of his day. Again, this is post-exile. They've seen Babylon come through and destroy the temple, destroy the city. They've been moved to exile. Now they're allowed to come back into land to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the laws. But we know there was some spiritual laziness going on within the new nation of Israel, or the returned nation of Israel. So maybe this is an emphasis to the Levites and the priests to get up, stop being lazy, stop feeling bad for yourself, whatever, whatever's calls in their spiritual lethargy. Get up and get moving. Follow the example of this generation. Look up to them. They showed leadership in their time. Now it's time for you to show leadership. 
again, we don't know that for sure. It can't be dogmatic. But it's, it seems like that could be a very legitimate possibility of including it here. Or, you know, we definitely know here that it's in here to show the support that Rehoboam is having. He's fortified these cities. The priests and Levites throughout all of Israel are coming to support him. And the reason why they're rejecting the northern kingdom in Jeroboam is seen in the last part of verse 14. For Jeroboam and his sons had excluded them from serving as priests to the Lord. And again, you can go back specifically in 1 Kings 12. We see the details of this. And we see the ongoing idolatry of Jeroboam in 1 Kings 13 and 14. He was a wicked man when it came to worshiping the Lord. He established his own worship system. He, as we are going to see, he establishes the golden calves. He established high places. He established idolatry. And he was afraid that people were going to go to the south to worship, and that's why he created this false worship system to keep people in the north. But obviously the Levites and priests, they follow the Lord and not Jeroboam. So again, we see further information, verse 15. He set up priests of his own. For the high places, and for the demons, are, there's different translations here. The satyrs. Some people have the goat gods. And for the calves which he made. So he's again establishing this false worship system. We know he has high places. We know he creates the two golden calves in Bethel and Dan. He creates his own priesthood because he doesn't want people going to the southern kingdom to rightly fulfill God's worship regulations. So verse 16, those from all the tribes of Israel, so once again, this is throughout the land, who set their hearts on seeking the Lord God of Israel, followed them to Jerusalem to sacrifice to Lord God of their fathers. So when it says those from all the tribes of Israel, I take this as to be more than just the priests and Levites. That as they came down to stand with Rehoboam, to worship as God had regulated through the Mosaic Covenant, that other Israelites from the tribes, from Dan, Naphtali, from Issachar, they all came down. Not all, but those who were seeking the Lord who had set their hearts to seek the Lord. So these are righteous Israelites from all the tribes coming down to worship the Lord. So there is a godly remnant within the northern kingdom who is not following, they are not following Jeroboam and his idolatry. And again, I think this goes to show the blessings and, and the strength of the southern kingdom following the division. So verse 17 says, They strengthened the kingdom of Judah and supported Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, for three years. And why? For they walked in the way of David and Solomon for three years. And when it says, walked in the way of Solomon, a lot of times we think of Solomon in a negative light. He committed a lot of idolatry. He basically is one of the culprits of leading the United Kingdom to division after his death. So there's a lot of negative things we can write about or talk about Solomon. But there's a lot of good. He started very well in his reign. Very well. He was a very wise man. He did great things, but idolatry led him astray. And he ended very poorly. But he started well, so I think that's the point here in verse 17. These people supported Rehoboam because they were living righteously. But take note, for three years... And that's what we're going to see next week, is that even though the southern kingdom started out well, as we, I think, see the evidence here in chapter 11, they end poorly. Or at least Rehoboam's reign ends poorly. Now let's close out this chapter with a look at Rehoboam's family. Verse 18, Then Rehoboam took as a wife, Machalat, the daughter of Jeremoth, the son of David, and Abihail, the daughter of Eliab, the son of Jesse. So he, he takes this lady as his wife. Notice that her father is a son of David, and her mother is the son of Jesse, David's father. So there's somewhat of intermarriage here. There's some close family ties. 
but that's probably not unusual for royalty in that time period. So we're seeing the family stay within the line of David or the family of David here. And then verse 19 says, And she bore him sons, Jeush, Shemariah, and Zeham. And then look at verse 20. After her he took Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, and she bore him Abijah, Etai, Ziza, and Shilomit. Shilomit. So, here's I think we start seeing some problems. Now some people say this, we're going to see all these children. That's obviously showing how God is blessing him. However, at the same time, I think there's a hint of some problems here. Okay, he marries this daughter of Jeremoth, and then after her, he marries another lady. So he continues the polygamous ways of really his grandfather and his father. And we know that's what led Solomon downhill. We know it, uh, David has some issues with the polygamy in his life. So he's, Rehoboam is following the same protocol. And I would say that this is starting to highlight the not-so-good future that we're headed to. Now, the Absalom there, just to make a side note, that's not probably the Absalom that we think of, of, of David's son who rebelled. Uh, in another section, the name is spelled Absalom. So, probably just a variation of spelling, so this is probably not the same Absalom. But keep, take note of the Abijah. We're not going to mention any of these other sons that are being born to Rehoboam except the one, Abijah. So keep, keep look out for him. Verse 21, Rehoboam loved Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, more than all his other wives and concubines. For she had taken, or he had taken 18 wives, so more than just the two, and 60 concubines, and fathered 28 sons, and 60 daughters. So again, some commentators would be like, see, God's blessing you. I don't think so. I think there's some problems here. I think the Chronicler is hint and hinting at some issues. Number one, we have the polygamy. Obviously, that violates uh, the earliest chapters of Genesis. And then obviously you have the concubine issue. There's also something else going on here. If you take note... Rehoboam, verse 21, loved Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, more than all the other wives. Now, that's the second wife, not the first wife. And why is that a problem? Well, verse 22 says, Rehoboam appointed Abijah, the son of Maacah, as head and leader among his brothers, for he intended him to make him king. Now, Maacah is the second wife. He loved her more than the first wife. Now, there's actually, in the Mosaic Law, and you can go to Deuteronomy chapter 21, a specific section talking about this type of scenario where you have two wives, and one is loved more than the other. And if it's the first wife who is not loved, like in this situation, her firstborn son is still the firstborn. He does not take the place of the loved wife. What's happening here? Abijah is the son of the loved mother who is the second wife. He should not be the firstborn. It considered the first. Now, it's not saying he's the firstborn here. But what it is saying is Ab uh, Ab Rehoboam made him the leader among the sons and intended him to make him king. So it's not technically calling him the firstborn, but it's almost treated, I would say, like the firstborn which would be a violation of the Mosaic Covenant. So not only do we have the polygamy going on here, but we have the favoring of a, of a non-firstborn son. Okay, don't want to be too dogmatic about that. But I do think, though we've seen the blessings of the southern kingdom so far, with the support of the priests and the Levites, the fortified cities, we see them obeying in the first four verses. We're starting to see some issues uh, creep in. But it ends in a positive note, verse 23. He acted wisely and distributed some of his sons through all the territories of Judah and Benjamin to all the fortified cities, and he gave them food in abundance, and he sought many wives for them. Now, that last part may be not so good, but the first part, it says he acted wisely 
He takes his sons, he distributes them, so maybe he's uh, making sure there's no rebellion within the family, as he's obviously favoring Abijah here. So the sons are sent away to watch over these fortified cities. Obviously, they have good provisions, the food in abundance. So they, they don't have to do anything, probably. I mean, they got the food. They don't have to They just kind of live a, a leisurely life, I guess. So he takes care of these sons. He fortifies the cities. Only 15. So yeah, maybe there's... Yeah, so maybe there's other fortified cities, though. But yeah, there's... Uh, there's definitely, there's a lot of sons there to take care of. So, and I'm not sure about the 60 daughters either. I'm not sure what kept them in line. So, But it ends on somewhat of a positive note. But that's not going to continue. Because as we see in chapter 12, we'll just preview. Chapter 12, verse 1, When the kingdom of Rehoboam was established and strong, again, that's the picture you get from chapter 11, he and all Israel with him forsook the law of the Lord. Let's just read verse 2. And it came about in King Rehoboam's fifth year, because they had been unfaithful to the Lord, that Shishak, king of Egypt, huh, all those fortified cities, huh, protecting the southern flank, came up against Jerusalem. We won't go on. Well, I'm tempted to go on, but we'll just leave it right there. <laughs> so interesting events happening in the southern kingdom here. So what do you walk away with? Again, we, we probably have to cover verse 12 and put those two, or chapter 12, and kind of put those two chapters together. But here's what I want to start. For, for 2 Chronicles chapter 11. Obedience was key to the spiritual health of Israel. Now, obviously, there has to be right motivation, too, as we see throughout the Old Testament. It's not just about actions. It's about actions with the right motives. Okay. But we see obedience here. We see Rehoboam and Judah and Benjamin. They listen to the Lord, uh, word of the Lord. They do not go up against the northern kingdom in Jeroboam. We see the support from the priests and Levites who come down. And we saw that specifically tied to the spiritual nature of the people in verse 16 who set their hearts on seeking the Lord. We see verse 17, that the kingdom was strengthened for three years, for they walked in the way of Psalm and, and David. So this is why I think we're seeing the southern kingdom start off on a good foot. They're obedient people for the most part. And that was a key to their health. Now, likewise, I would say, obedience is... Let me change that a second. I thought about this and decided... I want to say the key. Obedience is a key to our spiritual health. Because again, we can't say the key because obviously we got the word of the Lord that we have to study. We have the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It takes salvation even to justification even to get into this spiritual life. So I don't want to emphasize one over the other. So obedience is a key to our spiritual health as well. Different commandments. We're not under Mosaic law. We're not Israel. Talking about chapter 11, that's definitely in a more corporate sense. When we talk about us, we talk more individual, though we're part of the church, a second people of God. And eventually we'll get to John 15. We're in John 6 right now, so it'll take a little while to get there. But eventually we're going to hit John 15. And we know this is the upper room discourse of our Lord. And he says one of, the, one of the beautiful statements in this discourse is he's teaching his disciples, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And that section is about abiding in Christ. And when one abides in Christ, they produce spiritual fruit. And I think a key of the abiding is, obeying, uh, is, is obeying, being obedient. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments. And that's interesting. We see the Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, obeying His Father. So, if Christ is obeying the Father, how much more, or how much, if we go along and say, well, I can just do whatever I want in my spiritual life. I'm just a spiritual person. You know, that's, that's good enough. I mean, Christ has set the example, and who is it for us to say, 
I can act differently than him. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So, obedience is a key for our spiritual health as well. Just like it was in Israel. Even though there's two peoples of God, Israel and the church. There's some similarities there. So, with that, we'll end chapter 11. And next week, we'll pick up with chapter 12 and continue on and see how these two chapters are closely related together. And it will also officially end the, the reign of Rehoboam. So that in chapter 13, we look at his son that we've been introduced to here in chapter 11. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another day that you've given us to open your word to study these truths, and we just pray you'll write them in our hearts. We pray that you'll help us to be obedient. We know that it's not just simply um, pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We know it's not just solely dependent upon us, but our obedience is linked to your work in our lives as well. So we just pray that you'd help us to be obedient, you give us the strength and power to obey you in all things, that we can abide in Christ and produce much spiritual fruit for your glory. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.